In today's video, we're painting a traditional Japanese half sleeve. Welcome back to another video, guys. I'm Daggett, this is Daggett Designs. And like I said, in today's video, we're gonna be painting a Japanese half sleeve. Now, this is actually part two in a little series. So if you haven't seen part one, I'll leave a link down into the description on how we actually draw this design. So we go through the entire process, how to sketch the design and how to ink it. And in today's video, we're finally gonna be painting and completing our design. So with that having been said, let's go to the overhead. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the table. So in today's video, we're painting our koi fish design that we started in last week's video. This is a Japanese half sleeve design. And I'm gonna try and paint this in the more traditional manner and explain to you guys how that is done. So going through our palette to begin with, I've got solid carbon black. I've got a medium or mid gray wash using a drop of carbon black and then filling up my well about halfway with water. And then I've got a really light gray wash, which is the same as the medium gray wash, but it's diluted with even more water. I've got three brushes that we're working with today. You'll notice I normally work with two, but I like a larger brush for doing backgrounds. So these are uh, synthetic Taclon hair brushes. I've got a number five, a number six, and a number eight. Number eight being the largest one there. And I also have a glass of water that'll be used just for blending out colors and also for washing my brushes out. Now we're starting our design off primarily uh, using black and gray wash here because we're gonna start with the background and the black shading. This is how I like to start all of my paintings and generally speaking when you're tattooing, you'll do your black shading and your gray wash shading before you start adding color to your design. Now the way I'd like to do this is work from dark tones up across my design. So I think the easiest way to shade this and to explain it to you would be to flip my page and start working from this bottom corner here. So the first step would be to fill in all of your bars, your background bars, using your lightest gray wash. And I've done them in pencil, so they're, they're pretty light. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill them in. So just taking my medium brush here and some light gray wash, I'm gonna go ahead and fill in those areas of bars there. Now, of course, you kind of go ahead and erase your pencil lines or make them a lot lighter. Uh, generally, I'll do them very, very lightly, but I've sort of done them a little bit darker just so it's a bit easier and more readable for you guys on camera there. So as you can see, I'm just gently filling in these areas with a light gray wash and you can go lighter than this or darker than this. It's completely a personal preference and is up to you. The more water you add to your black, the lighter it's going to be. So. You can play around with different values and it depends how many layers you want to do. I tend to work in somewhere between two or three layers. Uh, any more than that and the paper can start getting damaged. So Now when you get to a larger area, so I'm skipping my rock. When I get to a larger area like this, it can help to take a larger brush uh, to apply your ink. So I'm going to take my number eight, uh, out of my, which is my largest brush size that we're working with today. And I'm gonna use that to fill in this area. It's gonna hold a little bit more water, so it'll you know, take a little bit more of that pigment with it when you pick it up. And it'll allow you to fill in much larger areas in a little bit smoother of a manner. You know, you're not sort of going back in and trying to smooth things out too much. So I'm just going in and you're going straight over the top of your tail there, the end of your tail. And don't worry about that getting grayed out that's gonna look like it's underneath our little section of water here. So that's gonna have a nice layering effect. And this is how you can start to get some of those really nice effects that you see with traditional uh, Japanese sleeve and half sleeve designs, where the water or the wind bars are sort of crossing over the top of the design. And it's sort of, you know, it sort of has a chaotic, messy look to it, but it still has this simplistic neatness to it as well. Uh, so now I'm going to go in with my medium brush again and I'm filling in all the areas of the next bar but these ones will not go over the top of my tail or any other design elements. They actually sit behind other areas. So I'm just going in between my finger waves here being careful not to actually paint on, over the top of my finger waves and filling in the areas of light grey behind them. Now coming down to the bottom area here and filling in the same way, but just being careful not to go over the top of my peony. 
Now, if you get a dark patch like that, wash your brush out and then go back over it. It'll actually absorb some of the pigment you just laid down uh, back into the brush and that'll help lighten it. So there's a little trick in case you get, you know, an area that's a little too dark or you put a little bit too much water and you're not too sure what to do. You can always wash the brush out to get rid of some of the pigment and then dry the brush and go straight back over the top and just soak up some of that water. So from here, what I'm gonna do is basically go ahead and continue painting in all of my wave bars with this light, uh, with my lightest tone of gray wash that I've got here. And I would encourage you guys to do the same. Just fill in all of your wave bars with this lightest tone. It's gonna look really flat at first and it's not gonna have any sort of depth and dimension to it, but this is sort of a building process. It's not gonna to come together instantly. There are many more layers of shading and color to add to this. So I think probably one of the biggest mistakes I see people make with uh, Japanese designs is they wanna do it quickly. They wanna quickly uh, rush the background because the background's not important or something like that. I would completely disagree with that. I think personally that the background in Japanese tattoos can almost be just as important as the main subject matter in a lot of ways. So it's important to take your time with your background shading and get it nice and smooth. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish off all of the wave bars and I'll meet you in the next part. All right, once you've gone through and done all of your light gray wash shading, you've filled in all of your wave bars there. You can go ahead and erase your pencil lines at this point if you'd like. So that's what I've gone ahead and done. And it will come up quite easily. You've just got to make sure that the ink has actually dried before you try to erase your pencil lines. And then we can go ahead into the next section. So I'm going to flip this guy again. And we're starting back from this end. That gives the top half of the design an ample amount of time to dry and really set. And it also helps us just continue on with the flow of things. So from here, what I'm going to do is you can use medium gray wash for this or you can use black for this it depends on the design it also depends on what part of the design you're doing so for example in this section down here i'm going to take a little bit of black on my inking brush okay i'm going to take a little bit of black ink and i'm going to fill in the bottom section of this bar here just like that then I'm gonna take my blending brush or my medium brush. I'm gonna feather that out and try to fade it up as smoothly as I can into my light gray wash there. So that we get a nice transition from our black up through to our gray. And that's gonna give you that really nice look that you have with traditional Japanese background work. And that's something that everyone always asks me about is how to get that smooth fade and in those sort of bars, you know, this is sort of the way that I do it. It's not the only way to do it, but this is the way that I do it. So I'm just applying some more black to this second bar now, and this will really help separate the two bars at the bottom here. So you can just apply a little bit more black to the base of this one. Trying to get it nice and even and then take your blending brush and run it across to feather that edge out. And once that's feathered out, it's pretty easy to just blend it up and across. You might need a bit more water and you might want to go in with a larger brush. Just depends how confident you are uh, with your blending ability. So I just go through and blend that up into my light gray wash. Now, as you can see, that's not the smoothest blend in the world. There's obviously some imperfections there, but I like to stress as well that you don't need it to be 100% perfect. Uh, you know, the ink will change a little bit once it dries as well, and that'll give you a different look. So you may even want to go back in over the top of it, but keep in mind, this is art and it's not supposed to be perfect, uh, you know, unless you're a perfectionist and that's what you sort of aim for. Art's supposed to be expressive, so I don't worry too much about having 100% perfect blends. I just do my best to get them nice and smooth. Now for this area that's obs uh, obscuring the tail and the end of my peony leaf here, you know, I don't really want that to be blacked out. I kind of want to be able to see through there. It's meant to be a little bit transparent. So I'm gonna take my larger brush and I'm gonna go into my medium gray wash. So this is gonna be significantly darker than my light gray wash, but it's not gonna be nearly as dark as black. So we're gonna take that tone of gray and go in over the top or the bottom area, I should say, of this bar here. 
that runs behind our rock. Then we can take some water and start blending that up into our light grey. Just the same way we did with the black, you're just gently blending that medium grey tone up into your light grey. And so this is what I was talking about when I said that we're layering uh, the inks and this is why you shouldn't worry too much if the first layer of grey isn't the smoothest or maybe doesn't have the depth that you would like you're actually going to start layering the inks to create these effects. Now another little tip, if you're not 100% happy with your black shading here and you want to bring it up more but you're scared of ruining it, you don't want to add too much black, you can actually go in with a bit of your medium grey wash, your medium darker tone of grey wash and add that in around the point that it blends to the light grey and then you can feather the edge of that out and blend it through. And this will help smooth out your transitions a little bit. I'm not going to bother touching that first one because I thought the transition was nice and smooth on that one. For the next little section that we're doing, we're doing the same thing. So medium grey wash. We're not doing black for this one. Uh, I tend to do black on bars that are standalone. So ones that don't overlap things and don't you know, end up as part of the uh, integrated into the design. They're sort of sitting on their own. Then I tend to use black for the shading portion of those. And for the parts that are more integral with the design, I try and use more medium tones and just create a little bit more depth there. The black can be a little bit harsh. It depends what you're doing with it and what areas of your design that you're shading as well. Okay, for areas like this bar here, it's quite a wide one. Not only that, but we've got an area that's nice and close to the body of our fish. There's nothing sort of in between this and our fish. So I am going to go in with a bit of black at the base of our uh, wave bar here. And I'm going to leave a little gap too because it does separate from our rock there. So coming in with a little bit of black at the base, probably not too much. Maybe just like that. And then we can work on blending that up. So feathering the edge of that black out and just gently blending that up. And of course you can go in and layer some medium gray wash over the top of this if you'd like. Now there's a couple of standalone bars. They're not really uh, interlocked with anything. They're not overlapping anything. So we can go ahead and use black on these if we want to make them nice and dark. Now you can always use medium gray before you do your black, uh, but I, I don't really see the point in doing that. I have seen people do it. Uh, I just think if you're going to go in with a really dark tone, on top of your medium gray, you may as well have done that and just blended it out. The black sort of blends out smoothly enough to where you shouldn't need to layer uh, other inks underneath it. So feathering that edge, and I'm using my large brush here and doing nice wide even strokes. If you start to play with your strokes a little bit as you do it, you'll begin to learn how to get smooth blends by moving across the page in the direction that you want the blend to be in. If you try and sort of drag the ink out and then scribble over the top of it, you'll end up with a bit of a muddy mess and you don't want that. You want this to be nice and smooth so we get that beautiful transition across from black to light grey. I'll do the same thing in this next section, just filling in the bottom of our wave bar with black. And you can sort of bring the black as high or as leave it as low as you would like to. That's very dependent on your style and how you want this to look. I know uh, some artists will bring it up nice and high and leave a very small sort of bridge of grey wash. And some people will leave out the black entirely and they'll only do grey wash, which I don't recommend. I think that makes the design look too light and doesn't give it enough depth. I think adding black is... Uh, absolutely crucial when doing tattoo design. Taking a, a blending brush here, feathering out that edge, and trying to get it smooth across. Now you can probably see I just went over the top of one of my finger waves, and I'm not going to stress about it. There's no point stressing out. Art's not supposed to be perfect, and I can always go in and fix a small mistake like that later on. All right, now we've reached another area that sits behind some stuff, but it's sort of going down behind our fish and behind our rock here, and it is touching the fin of our fish. So I'm gonna add a little bit of black to the base of this area. And uh, there's no hard and fast rules here with doing the backgrounds. I think that you can sort of play around with them a little bit. You know, there's, there's a little, little bit of wiggle room to play around and come up with your own ideas of how you want them to look. 
I like for them to be, you know, sort of a medium tone. I know some people like their backgrounds to be really dark. And some people like them to be super light and washy. And that's fine as well. I like them to be nice and even. Just a nice even amount of contrast in my designs. So I'm just blending that black out into our lightest tone there. And then coming around the other side of our rock with just a little bit of black on this side of the rock. And we can blend that up and out. So I believe you guys probably have a pretty good grasp of this technique by now. I'm gonna go ahead and finish all of my wave bars with our black and medium grays. And then I'll see you in the next part. All right, now once you've done all of your second layer on your wave bars here, you can see it starts to add a nice amount of depth to your design. We're going into doing our rocks and other background elements now. So I'm gonna flip this guy around once again. we we'll start down this end again. I'm gonna take my medium brush and a bit of my solid carbon black. Your rocks are gonna be primarily black. So just coming down from the bottom and filling in a nice large area of black. Being nice and careful not to, you know, not to disrupt your gaps too much. You've got some nice gaps down the bottom there. And then you wanna start following the shape of your rock a little bit with your black at the top here. Just follow the shape a little bit. It doesn't have to be perfect. Once you've done that, I like to take my blending brush or my largest brush and soften those edges out. You wanna blend those edges up nicely, softening everything out like this. Yeah, just like that. Soften out all those edges and bring it up to a gray before you reach sort of the more detailed areas of your rock at the top there where you've got all those little textures and that. And you want a nice line of white all around the edge of your rock. So don't add too much gray or black around the edges there. So I'm gonna go ahead and paint in all of our rocks now using that same method. Okay, once you've done the black shading on your rocks, you can really start to see that how this design comes together. Um, the background itself starts to pull together really nicely and the rocks add a nice dark element of solid black areas to it. We're gonna start working on the finger waves now. So the way that I like to do these is I start with some light gray wash and I just go in, I'm going behind this little strip of water that's running across our design. I don't want to uh, get any gray on that, at least for now. I'm coming in the other side of it with our gray wash, starting to come onto our finger waves. And then I'm gonna take some water and blend that out into the fingers of our waves here. Just trying to get a nice light tone and try to reach white before you reach the end of your finger waves there. So blending this out, we've done finger waves on the channel many times, so I'm just gonna run you guys through it quickly uh, so that you get a good idea of how to do it. So once you've done all of your light areas, you can go ahead and fill in all of your finger waves at the same time with a light gray like that blending it out to a white. And then we're gonna take our medium gray wash and we'll just go back in and add a second layer of gray to darken it a little bit in areas. So for example, we've got some waves happening here that are overlapping the section underneath them. So for the section underneath, I'm gonna come in with a slightly darker tone of gray. And again, just blend that out into the fingers of your waves here. So now we have a little bit of layering happening there. And the top section of this wave is being underneath the fish here. So there's a little bit of a shadow coming from the underside of our body there that you can just layer in and sort of whip out into those fingers. Now, before we go any further, I just wanna say a big thank you to those of you who have purchased the Ultimate Dragon Brush Pack from my website. Uh, this was a brush set that I developed, which basically, in my opinion, has the best tools that you can get uh, for the iPad Pro for learning how to draw dragons. So you've got dragon body tools, different tails, front limbs and back limbs, all in different styles, multiple different head designs to choose from, as well as some background elements to create illustrations such as this. So I really just wanna thank you guys who have gone ahead and purchased this one. I really hope you're enjoying it. And if you don't know that this one is available, it is out right now over at daggettdesigns.com.au. 
Now, most of the black shading is finished. We still have a little bit of black to go and all of our gray wash shading is finished. So I'm gonna go over my palette now. We've got solid carbon black. I've got yellow, orange, azo or golden yellow. This is sap green permanent mixed with golden yellow. I've also got a vivid red orange color and I've also got a, um, a muted pink or a light pink sort of tone uh, for doing our flowers. So we're gonna start by adding in the last bits of our black and black shading here. To start that off, there's a little bit of black that we're doing at the very top of the head. And I'm gonna make sure I'm leaving a little bit of white, a little bit of a gap before we touch the line there for some reflected light. And you're just gonna apply a little bit of black to the top section of your head like that, the back corner there. And then just with your blending brush, you can blend that out and down and across the top most portion of the head, just like that. That'll add a little bit of uh, shading to the top of our head there before we add our color. Now the other bit of black that we still have to do is on the scales on the body. So we're gonna start by doing like a couple of the top row here coming down the body and then you can start to branch out and add in some variations. So we're gonna come in and start with our first scale here. Now when you're doing these, you wanna be quite careful and you wanna make sure you're leaving a nice gap around the outside of your scale, the outside edge of your scale. So you don't wanna go right to the edge of your scale. You wanna make sure you're leaving a little gap. And just apply your black ink like that. And you're basically going to repeat that for any scales that you want to be black. I like to do the top two rows normally. It depends on the design. Sometimes I'll do the top two rows and occasionally what I'll do is, which is what we're gonna to do today, is do the top row and then go in and add random black scales through the body of the fish that's gonna end up looking a little bit like a pattern. So sometimes you have those koi fish that have black splotches all over their body, black splotches. And this is going to be one of those style of koi fish. So we can add some variation to where we put our black scales and that's gonna really help sell that effect of that, you know, that type of koi fish. I also think it just looks really nice when it's a little bit more random and not so perfect and precise. So just filling in your scales for this top row and making sure to leave those nice big gaps. Now I've gone in and done all of the scales that I want to be black, but I do want to point out while these are completely random, there are some important design elements to think about. So our fins are going to be primarily the same color as our scales, you know, like it's, there's not going to be a big difference between the fins and the scale color. So when I come to an area like this, where the fin actually overlaps the body, and especially these round areas of the fin are quite a similar shape to our scales as well. I'm gonna do a large heavy area of black scales underneath that. That way when I come in to do my fin, it'll really stand out as color and it'll really stand forward as a fin instead of blending in with the rest of the body. So that's a nice little tip for you guys if you're doing designs like these. Make sure you, you know, try not to put the same color right next to each other. Instead, you know, break it up a little bit with some black or maybe with a gap of white. So from here, that's basically it for our black shading. We're gonna go in now with our color and we're gonna start by using our vivid red orange and we're gonna come up into our face for that. So I've already washed my brush out and I'm just loading it up with this vivid red orange. It's a really nice color. And we're gonna come down from the top, going over the top of our black and gray shading here and bringing that right down behind the eye where the gills are and just bringing that forward onto the head. And once I reach probably about here, I'm gonna stop like that. Take my blending brush with a bit of water and start to blend that vivid red orange down onto the face in a lighter sort of tone. Blending out into the whiskers. I'm gonna bring that around the back of the eye, being sure to leave some uh, skin breaks or some white gaps where you'd like them to be. And if there's not enough vivid red orange coming around the back there, you can always add a little bit more to your brush and just work it around. And from here, I'd want to apply a little bit more 
of this color to the ring that's around the eye here, around the back, like that. And then with the blending brush, I'm just bringing that color down and around toward the eye. And I'm trying my best to just leave a little white gap around the area where you've got your line work there. For the front portion where the mouth is, you can come out with a little bit of your vivid red orange just from the bottom here. Again, I'm leaving a little bit of white and then I'll just blend that up and across the mouth like this. Now, once you've done your vivid red orange in the head, we're gonna continue down the body using that same color. And we're gonna basically come in and paint our scales the same way that we did the black scales. Now, it's important to point out here that I turn my page to give me a better angle at which to paint. So you can just turn it to whatever angle you find most comfortable. And then just come in between your black scales and start adding in scales of your vivid red orange. And you want this to just be solid vivid red orange. There's no mixing or blending in these. Making sure you leave those same gaps around each of the scales. Now, once you've done most of your scales in that color, there's a few scales here and there, little patches of it. So I've just washed my brush out once again. And I'm going into my yellow orange azo for those. So just coming in with yellow orange azo and pa painting in those scales. So there's a lot that can be done and I encourage you guys to get creative with it and you know, play with the design, make it your own. You don't have to follow my designs to a T, that's not what this is about. Now we're also gonna be using a bit of that yellow orange azo in the gills back here. So just coming in from the top with a bit of that color and then I'm gonna blend that down because I want it to sort of get a bit lighter as it moves down through the gill. So just blending that down. And I also want to take a bit of yellow orange azo uh, in around the eye here. So just putting in a ring of it, no blending around our eye. All right, we're now going to move on to doing the tails and the fins. I'm going to start with this fin uh, just by rotating my page around. And we're going to start by putting down some of our vivid red orange towards the end of our fin here. So just laying down a nice amount of your vivid red orange towards the end of your fin, like this. And then you can take your blending brush with some water, blend that out in a circular fashion following the shape of your fin and just coming back towards the body of your fish there. Now that you've done the vivid red orange on your fins, the next step would be to wash your brush out, go into your yellow orange azo or your golden yellow there. And you're gonna go straight over the top of your vivid red orange at the end of your fins. And just bring that right back down into where it starts to look more yellow. Then take your blending brush and you can gently blend that on back to a nice pale yellow. Now, when you get down to doing the tail, you're gonna do the same method you used on the fins using your vivid red orange and your yellow orange azo. For the fold over portion, you're going to color that in with your vivid red orange. And I'll probably leave a little bit of a gap around the edge of that fold over to help separate things once I bring some vivid red orange to the other side of the fin. So leave a bit of a gap. Then you can bring a little bit of your vivid red orange to the inside of that section there, just being careful. And then take your blending brush and bring that color back a little bit. Just coming up to your gap and then skip your gap and bring that color through a little bit more, just like that. For the other side of the tail, it's gonna be the exact same as your fins. So you're just coming in uh, with your vivid red orange towards the bottom there. Not stressing out too much about where we're coming up to. Bringing it up to that little white gap and then just blending it on up. Now, once those areas of the tail have dried, you can take your yellow orange azo and go over the top of them the same way you did with the fins. So straight over this part on the fold over and straight over the section just beneath that with our yellow orange azo, bringing it right up to our gap there and then doing a small line of it just after our gap 
for taking your blending brush and blending that to a nice light yellow and eventually up into white before you reach the end of the body there. And the other side's gonna be exactly the same thing with your yellow orange azo just coming over the top of your orange yellow there and blending up. Now you've got majority of your design colored in. We're gonna go ahead and do the flowers and we're gonna start by doing the leaves. So washing out your brush and going into your sap green and yellow orange azo mix to get a nice sort of green color, green tone color. And we're gonna come down to this peony and start with the leaves. So starting off with this leaf that's obscured by the water here, you can just come in with your color nice and solid like this. And I'm not gonna do any blending on these, I'm just doing them solid green. But I am leaving a little gap around the edge of the entire leaf. So in this case, it'll be a gray gap because this is underneath our gray wash and the colors are gonna be slightly desaturated. And for the other areas, it will be a white gap around my leaves. But other than that, there's no specific uh, blending or shading that I'm doing for the leaves. I'm just going in and doing them a solid green color. And bringing solid green. Now, if you used solid sap green permanent, it would be too dark for this application. You would need to blend it out. But I like to dilute my sap green with a yellow, which adds a little bit more of a nice uh, lush sort of color to it instead of that sort of dark forest color. And just allows me to get a slightly uh, slightly nicer color without blending or shading my greens. You're gonna do this for both leaves on your other peony as well. Now the other thing I'm gonna use my sap green for is the little star shaped part in the center of my peony here. And I'm just gonna do that solid sap green. So I'm not worrying uh, about leaving any gaps on this area. Just solid sap green for that little area on the inside there. And you can do that on both flowers as well. And the other thing you're gonna do for the center of the flowers is a bit of your yellow orange azo uh, around that green star in the middle. So that's gonna be for your stamens. And you're gonna color them in yellow orange azo and that little dot in the very center. And you can do that for both flowers as well. Now, while we wait for those areas of the flowers to dry so that we can start painting the petals, I'm gonna take a Copic brush marker. You could go ahead with a Sharpie or just your regular fine liner, pretty much however you'd like. And I'm just gonna add a bit of pattern work onto my fish. So coming onto the head here, I'm adding in some squiggles like this, and you can fill those in. In fact, realistically, you could use your carbon black ink and your brush to do this. But I just find it a lot easier to come in afterwards with a marker and do it. And I can be a little bit more precise with my shapes and how I want them to look. So a little bit of pattern on the top of the head. Might come in behind the eye a little bit here with a bit of a pattern shape like this. And these can be whatever shape you want them to be. Coming onto our fins a little bit, you can just add some spots and splotches wherever you'd like them to be. And this is gonna help with that speckled effect with those fish that have uh, you know, the pattern work through their body and their fins. Now those areas of our flowers should be dry, we can start to paint them. So I'm coming in here with a muted pink. Of course, you can do whatever you color you'd like. In fact, the vivid red orange that we used in our fish is one of my favorite colors to do peony flowers, uh, but I wanted to do it for the fish on this one. So I'm coming in with a muted pink, which will make for a nice combination here. And I'm gonna leave some little gaps like this and then blend that up into the ends of my petal. Coming around the back of that little line. Now pretty much the technique for doing these is leaving little skin breaks and having dark areas at the base of your petals and blending them up to lighter areas. So it's pretty straightforward uh, for doing your peonies here, but I like to just make sure I'm leaving nice uh, skin breaks around the edges of most of the line work. It doesn't have to be for all of it. In fact, it doesn't have to be at all if you don't want to do it that way. It's completely up to you, but I like to make sure I'm leaving enough uh, 
enough white there on the page, enough gaps on the page there uh, between areas of color. I think that looks really nice. And that tends to be uh, the, I don't want to say the traditional way because I might be wrong, but that's what it looks like to me when they do traditional designs. They leave a lot of these large open areas of skin and that looks really, really nice. Now pretty much once you've done the outside of your petals, you can go for the inside, which is pretty much the same. You're coming in from the inside of the petal with a darker tone and moving towards the edge of the petal, you're gonna blend it out to a lighter tone there. So coming in the back of the petal here with a dark tone and blending that out and across to a lighter tone. Pretty simple, trying to reach white before you get the end of each petal. Now there's a little technique I like to use to separate even the inside of the petals a little bit, make it look like there's some ridges and folds. So what I'll do is bring a little bit of my color up like this. And I'll just blend that through as always. And I'm gonna leave that harsh line there. I'm not gonna blend that out. And I'm gonna leave a little gap next to that and add a little bit more of my color here to the other side. And then I'll blend that up on the other side of the petal here. Just like that. And I'll leave that little strip of white in there and that'll help break the petals up and make them look a little bit uneven like there's some gaps. All right, now I've got to point out one thing. I did change uh, the color of the base peony here at the bottom. I went ahead and added some dioxazine purple to my muted pink. And this was just to change the tone a little bit so that they weren't absolutely identical. Other than that, I did it in the exact same manner that we did the peony flower that's at the top there. And once I have signed off on this one, it is complete. And that is it for this Japanese half sleeve design. I really hope you enjoyed this one, guys. Um, I'd like to make more of these, so leave a comment in the comments section down below letting me know what subject matter you'd like to see, if you'd like to see small tutorials, or if you prefer these large design tutorials. I'd like to do more half sleeve designs, maybe chest pieces or back pieces. You guys will have to let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one. Keep up all the drawing. Bye-bye. If you like the content that I make and you'd like to support the channel, make sure you smash that like button. And hey, while you're at it, check out one of these other great videos.